Welcome, everybody, to another show of the Replacement Level Podcast. I am your host, Chris Phillips. Today, we will be joined by special guest, Melissa Lockhart. Before we get to that, though, just a reminder for everybody out there, this is one of the better shows on Major League Baseball and baseball in general. So be sure to follow us, give us a like, share with us. We discuss everything that is going on in the baseball world. But like I said, we have a special guest, Melissa Lockhart, on with us today. She is the editor and or senior editor and staff writer at The Athletic, founder of the Oakland Clubhouse, and a member of the Bay Area chapter of the BBWAA and formerly of the Oakland Clubhouse. So Melissa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me i appreciate it absolutely so um i'm curious why there's so many bees in the bbw since it's the baseball writers like <laughs> i guess it's two bees in baseball but yeah <laughs> i don't know that, that was well before my time i think <laughs> okay okay perfect um so yeah welcome in great to have you um and just, you know, um, really, real quick, Melissa, how did you get started with all of this from like founding the Oakland Clubhouse, joining the Athletic, and being a member of the Baseball Writers Association? Yeah, it's a, kind of an unusual journey. Um, I actually was a marketing per- professional by trade, um, but I've always loved baseball. And um, back in the early 2000s, I've started. Uh, a blog on the most valuable blog network, which was uh, called MVN. It was a long, long, long time ago Um, and was writing about the A's and uh, something called the insiders at the time reached out to me and said, hey, you know, we do these sites where essentially you're the publisher. You come up with all the content yourself, um, but we host it. And um, generally speaking, the way we find subscriptions are sold is if you give information people can't get from regular beat writers. So uh, the angle was that you know minor league baseball was something that people were not getting a ton of information on yet. Um, and so I kind of just started out on the ground. I mean, literally just like sending out emails and being like, hey, I would love to come see Sacramento Rivercats or the Stockton Ports. And, you know, will you host me in there? And um, kind of grinded for years doing that as a second job. Like, you know, I had a regular full time uh, gig and um, did that for a long time. Then eventually I actually went in house with it became called Scout, went from insiders to Scout um, and had a dual role with them. I was kind of managing all the MLB publishers that were like myself um, and also was like their publisher support person. So I would train new publishers that would come onto the platform um, on our very arcane at the time <laughs> technology platform. I would teach them HTML, which they thought they all had forgotten a long time ago and all the different things that we were doing. Um, helped with customer support when things came in there. Um, did that for a long time and then in 2017 they were sold to cbs and they weren't going to do baseball as uh, one of their offerings anymore it was really going to focus on just college sports and so i decided that that was a good time for me to to make a change so um took my site actually on my own wasn't sure what i was going to do was writing for a whole bunch of different publications as a freelance writer um, including the athletic and um, managed to be part of their launch as a freelance writer um, and then they had an opening for an editor writer role like in January of 2018 and, and I was in the right place at the right time and have been with them ever since. So uh, the athletics obviously changed quite a lot in the last five years um, and my role has shifted uh, quite a bit. I used to just uh, edit Bay Area sports. Now I'm on an MLB desk. So I, you know, I'm responsible for editing uh, teams that are, you know, well outside of the Bay Area, Toronto. Um, and, and a number of other areas. So um, that's changed, but you know, it's been nice to have a full-time baseball only job, you know, that, that was something that, you know, took about 20 years to get to, but I finally got to it. So. Awesome, that's a really cool story for sure. Um, so since it sounds like you've kind of did the minor leagues and also the majors, do you have a preference in which you like covering better? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think to me, it's all one story, right? Like, you can't tell the story of Major League Baseball without fully understanding how these guys got there. It's so different from the NBA and the NFL, where, um, you know, college sports is really what you see as the the leader into, you know, their professional careers, or in in the NBA's case, it might even be high school. But, um, you know, there's a journey for every single player that gets to the big leagues, Um, unless you play for the Angels, it's, you know, it's going to be usually longer than 
30 games. Um, but those stories kind of tell the story of like how players get to where they are. And I think the more that writers understand the sort of full circle thing that takes place for each player that's in the big leagues, um, you know, the better understanding we have of the sport and, you know, and why really baseball is the hardest sport in the world to play, right? Like it's not just physically demanding, but the amount of um, dedication that every major league baseball player has to make in order to get to the big leagues uh, is well beyond, I think, anything that you see in any other sport. And so um, I just enjoy telling stories. And I think the stories that you can tell about guys that start out at rookie ball, no matter where they're drafted and then get to the big leagues is, is just a lot of fun. Do you have like a favorite story that you can remember that, or that maybe that one is like stuck out with you the most or at this yeah. point they're all... I mean, there, there's a lot of fun stories. I mean, I think maybe just timely because Sean Doolittle announced his retirement last week, but, you know, he was always a, a big favorite of mine. Um, you know, he started out as a first base prospect uh, in the A system back in, in 2007. He was drafted out of Virginia. Um, you know, was really one of their top position player prospects and then basically had two and a half seasons of just not being able to play because he was injured. Uh, ran the to a wall. He had pitched in college, but, you know, really the team had seen him as a position player. And, you know, I think he had been rehabbing a knee injury for a while, finally got the knee healthy and then hurt his wrist and was like, listen, I just don't think this is going to happen. And the infrastructure for the A's uh, player development said, well, why don't we try pitching? Let's keep your baseball career going. And he de dedicated all of it. And within six months was a big league reliever on a team that surprised everybody and won the American League West division title. So, I mean, I think that that's, there's a lot of good stories. That's one of many, but I, I love that story because, you know, here's a guy that was at the end of his career probably, and, and was able to make a change. And 11 years later, he's retiring as a big leaguer with the World Series ring. I think that's really awesome. That is really cool, for sure, for sure. So going back to the Baseball Writers Association, how did you become a member of that? And like, how long have you been a member? Yeah, so um, I'll be honest, you know, it was never like, something that I was really striving for separate from my career. I think it was something that was always going to be part of what um, I was doing. If I was doing it well enough, then eventually that would be something that could kind of come into it. But, you know, basically they needed to see that I was doing this full time. And as long as I had these other jobs that I was having to do, um, it was never going to happen. So um, once I was at The Athletic um, and I was full time editing and writing about, you know, baseball, um, they were you know, like just apply and then you can, and you can get in. So, um, you know, I knew a lot of the people in that world for a long time because it had been 17 years, I think of a career up to that point. Um, so I think once I was able to kind of cross that threshold, um, it, it wasn't too hard. So, but it's a great organization. I've learned a lot, um, from, you know, there's just so much that you can learn from somebody who's been doing this 20, 30, 40 years, um, how much the game has changed, how you approach different situations. I mean, you know, um, it, clubhouses are tricky, interpersonal relationships with sources are tricky. And so, you know, having those people to talk to is, is really beneficial. Now you get to vote on the Hall of Fame class and everything like that, correct? I, I'm not quite, uh, I think so. It, that's a five year, I think. Um, so I'm not quite to Hall of Fame, but I do uh, vote on the awards every year. So um, this year I'll be voting for the American League Rookie, Rookie of the Year award. So, yeah. Can you share that, or do you have to keep that hush hush? For uh, I probably should. I probably should keep it hush hush. Although I mean, I think you know, there, there's a certain guy in Baltimore who I'm pretty sure is going to run away with it, and you know, I think he he's at the top of my list. But I, I, you know, it's you get three that you you know you get one, two, three. It's not like the MVP where you get to go down ten. So it becomes actually tricky because. Um, you know, when you're looking at an MVP or a Cy Young ballot, you can kind of give credit to guys that had really great seasons and put them a little, you know, down ballot. But with Rookie of the Year, there's only three slots. And so um, kind of just even in a runaway situation where one guy is clearly that guy, um, having to decide who the next two guys are um, can be almost as difficult as picking the actual first place guy because you want to give credit to the great seasons and there's only three that you get a chance to do that with so um, that 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 part I think I've actually had a lot more trouble with this year then because there's a there's a it's a great rookie class and um, there's a lot of guys that are not going to end up on ballots that really should be on them so yeah you know we had an episode a while back I think in season maybe around the all-star time um, and we kind of gave our initial like 
who's the front runner for the awards and like who we thought would be you know the ultimate winner and like i know for the nl side like my vote was for corbin carroll like he's sure. he's just been phenomenal he's been able to do it all year long there's other deserving rookies of it like you mentioned but like to me like he's kind of the the runaway winner and then like over on the al side like like you said, there are several candidates out there that could make a very strong case as to why they should be the award winner at the end of the year and stuff. So uh, it's definitely the award times are fun to look at. And I feel like even for like your MVPs and Cy Youngs and stuff like that, um, some of the races that we thought might have been locked up um, have kind of tightened up over this last couple of months and stuff. Um, so it'll be fun to see. Um, I can't wait to see who you know, get in contact with you and see who you voted for. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm just totally not sure who that guy is in Baltimore that you're talking about. So, <laughs> um, so the biggest storyline I think for the Oakland A's this season and even, even last season, um, maybe not so much their performances on the field, but I do understand that they, they are doing a rebuild has been what is going to be the future of this organization. Yeah. And with that, what is the latest with them? I believe they've actually, it's official they are going to be going to Vegas? Well, yeah. I mean, so they have an agreement in place to go to Vegas. They don't actually have um, stadium rendering plans or a parcel of land that would fit that stadium or the votes yet from the owners. So there are still quite a few boxes to check. I think, um, you know, from the ownership perspective, they're going to tell you that they're going there. But, um, you know, I think we've seen other relocation efforts, including the San Francisco Giants back in the early 90s that were further down the road than they are um, about moving and didn't end up happening. So I think there's still a chance that it won't happen. Um, that being said, I think uh, the way things are stacked up, if an owner wants something now in this environment for Major League Baseball with the commissioner that they have, that owner almost always gets it. Um, so chances of it not happening are probably, you know, fairly low, even if some of the other, it, it would take a significant percentage of the owners to say, listen, I don't think this guy deserves to move there, or have his relocation fee waived and all this sort of stuff. Um, and I don't know that owners at this point are going to speak out against other owners because they all have invested interest in kind of using their cities to get as much money out of them for stadiums as possible. Um, but that would probably be the only thing that could really stop it at this point. Uh, unless like the state of Nevada has a re, you know, a, um, a vote that kind of takes back the public funding that they, um, gave out, you know, there's a referendum that they're hoping to get on the ballot. Um, but that's probably a long shot at this point. Okay. I did see a, a report and this is a few weeks ago that apparently if Oakland does move out, well, if the A's move out of Oakland, that Oakland would essentially vault to being one of the top teams to get like a brand new franchise, which to me kind of seems like, well, if you're going to be the team to get a brand new franchise in there, why are you moving this team all together? Why not just keep the team you have there and put a new franchise in a new state and like expand to a brand new like fan base there? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. I, I think that is one of the more mind blowing parts of this whole thing that if they think the market is and it is good enough to have a major league franchise in it, um, there's no reason to take the franchise out of there that has a 60 year history and a fan base that's already built in. So um, it, it's really one of the 87 things that are very confusing about why this is happening at this point. Um, you know, I do think, yeah, you know, you look at like the markets that would remain after Las Vegas was taken. Um, there are no markets that have a bigger media share, even sharing it with the Giants than Oakland um, on that list. And so, you know, obviously, I would think Major League Baseball is still in, in the you know business of trying to kind of maximize their media potential. Um, and, uh, you know, that would make it very attractive. But, you know, it's sort of like the Cleveland Brown situation, right? Like, why move that franchise to Baltimore? change the whole name and then bring in this like zombie version of the, of the Browns, you know, a few years later, like it, it created so much disruption. It, it just seemed like a silly thing and the NFL, you know, did it anyway. So, um, you know, maybe that's what happens. It's hard to say. Okay. All right. Well, I personally want to see the A's stay in Oakland. They are one of the first teams, like I kind of followed back when I was, a kid um mainly because jose canseco because sure. as a kid I like to say jose canseco says or 
Jose Canseco say something like that. So like that was like, oh yeah, Oakland, that's awesome team and everything and like green and yellow and white are the colors. So like, cool. Um, obviously I've become a Mariners fan over the years and stuff, but I do remember the A's always being there and always being a, a team for basically my entire life. And it would be weird not to have the Oakland A's, even if it's the A's like name stays in Oakland. The fact that the original franchise moves out is it's going to be confusing and weird. Like, like you said, so I'm pulling for them to get everything sorted so that team can stay there and a new baseball team can come into a brand new city with a whole new market. That would be, I think, the best route, but um, I guess we'll see. So uh, moving, over to, like, <laughs> moving over to a little bit happier discussion than what's going on with the, the A's organization, their uh, relocations. This team, like I said, they are rebuilding. And so unfortunately, it means there's a lot of losing and it can be for a very, very long season and make fans like disinterested. Who is a hitter and a pitcher that the A's are kind of like, this is the guy and we're going to build everything around, you know, this hitter and this pitcher going forward? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's interesting when you were talking about the rookie of the year discussion and the fact that you had a show around the All-Star break. And I think a guy that came up literally right after that All-Star break is probably the guy that you're you're talking about is the new face of the franchise is Zach Geloff. And, you know, um, I mean, he's a guy that has thrust himself into that rookie of the year discussion in that second or third place thing. And he's only played 70 games, right? Like, I think it's technically 68, I think, going into today. So, um, you know, but he's a guy that I think both from a personality and a talent and production perspective could be the face of the franchise, assuming that they ever lock anyone up more than a couple of years. Um, it hits for power, runs the bases incredibly well, um, was a third baseman in college. And so it took him a little bit to adjust to second base, but I think you're starting to see that plus defensive uh, capability there a second. And he really like, if you look at the profile, it's not dissimilar to what you would have seen if Marcus Simeon had been a second baseman the whole time, you know, like that sort of profile of uh, a guy that's going to see a lot of pitches. He may strike out a lot, but he's going to get on base. Um, he's going to hit home runs. He's going to steal bases. And his leadership ability is very similar, I think, to Marcus in that um, he's not going to be a guy that like necessarily you know, is on the bulletin boards, but he's a guy that everyone in that clubhouse instantly respects, even as a rookie. Um, and that work ethic is something that I think everybody, uh, you know, really tries to emulate that's ever played with him throughout the minor leagues and all the way up. So um, he's he's definitely the answer there on, on the position player side. Pitching, I think they're still kind of finding their way, you know. Um, they, they had some guys that I think, uh, if you dig under the hood a little bit, the numbers are better than, you know, especially uh, lately than they had been. Um, Ken Maldichuk in particular had a terrible first two months. I think since you know about mid June or so, has actually been a pretty reliable starter. Um, actually, even in a role where he was kind of coming in after an opener and pitching four or five innings after that. But um, you know, he has a chance to be a solid kind of three, four starter in the big leagues for a while. JP Sears is another guy that sort of fits that mold. The only guy, well, there's probably two guys that could potentially be, you know, sort of top of the rotation type um, starters and Mason Miller and Joe Boyle, who um, Boyle just debuted last week. Um, both of those guys throw, you know, upper 90s. Miller is like in the early, you know, low 100s pretty regularly. Um, but with Miller, it's a, it's a matter of staying healthy. And so I think we'll have to see if um, he can put together full seasons um, as a starter or if eventually, you know, the bullpen will have to be where he goes because of, of, of injuries. Uh, Boyle, you know, his, his walk numbers were super high in the minor leagues, but a lot of that was in the double A when he was with the Reds and they were using that weird ball that I think nobody liked in the Southern League. I don't know if any if you guys have followed that storyline a lot, but it was like a pre-tacked ball that like was driving pitchers crazy. And so um, his numbers are not, he's not a control artist by any means outside of that, but he's much more reasonable in terms of his command um, when using a normal baseball, which sounds ridiculous, but that's basically how they've structured minor league baseball lately the last few years with all the experiments they're running. So, um, you know, I think his command tightens even just a little bit. And with the stuff that he has, he's a really good chance of being like a, you know, real solid number two starter for a long time as well. So um, those are the guys that, you know, I would probably pin on at this point, but um, they've got a lot of work to do on the pitching side. 
Okay. All right. Um, I know that last year the A's made some trades, and apparently they became like best friends with the Atlanta Braves and sending <laughs> Sean Murphy and, in a separate deal, Matt Olson over to them. And the, both those deals have worked out pretty well for the Braves, I say. I mean, that Matt Olson guy seems to have no problems hitting the baseball, and Sean Murphy's really, I think, blossomed into the full potential that people thought he could do. Um, but the A's, on the other hand, have received what I've kind of seen and heard a lot of some real criticism for their return on the players they got. Is that kind of fair? Like, did they did the A's really make bad trades, or is it just hey, just because these guys aren't producing or having great years this year, like let's give them some time? Like, there is a lot to like in there, and like the A's made a good choice. Yeah, I mean, I think when you're trading for prospects, there is a, a longer window for judging a trade that, you know, like <clears throat> I, I go back to the Marcus Simeon deal, you know, when when the A's traded, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Jeff Samarja to the White Sox, uh, people panned that deal. They just said they, they got nothing in return and they got Marcus Simeon, Chris Bassett and Josh Fegley, um, you know, who were all. I mean, Fegley was like a solid backup catcher and the other two are, are, are all-stars, right? But it took four, three to four years for anyone to realize that that they got um, a really good end of that deal. Uh, I would be a little surprised if either of these deals in retrospect become that. Um, I do think Shea Langoliers, who they got from Matt Olson, is, uh, you know, continues to get better. I think the the burden that he had in trying to deal with the pitching staff that was all over the place at the beginning of the year really impacted his offensive uh, production. But I think he's the best throwing catcher in baseball. Um, and, you know, the stats pack that up. Um, you know, he's he's had a lot that he's had to handle as a rookie from a, you know, game calling perspective that I think um, will continue to get better. And the power, I mean, he's one of the better power hitting catchers in the league. So the average is low, um, you know, but as you looked at Sean Murphy, averages tend to be low when you're playing at the Coliseum anyway. So, you know, you put him in Atlanta, he may have actually similar offensive numbers to to what you've seen from Sean Murphy. Um, and so, you know, I think there's uh, there's some to come out of there. I think Asturia Ruiz, um, you know, who they got in roundabout way in that, that, that Murphy deal is um, an exciting player. He isn't a perfect player, right? Like, you know, I think there's... Um, Something to be said, though, for, um, you know, perfect being the enemy of good, if that makes sense. Like, I think on a team that was more functionally put together, he would be a really interesting piece um, because of what he can do. Um, I think put him in left field. So center field is, I think, you know, he's an infielder that got moved to the outfield and he looks like an infielder that got moved to the outfield when he's in center field. But you put him in left field, the defensive numbers don't drag down his value as much. Um, I think he's done good job getting on base in spurts and i think that'll be some, you know a focus He's, he has a track record in the minor leagues of being a good on base guy so he gets on base at like a 350 percentage and he's a force because he's on third base before you can you know blink your eye right so um you know i think there's i think those two players there's potential there i like joey estes as a starter that they got in the olsen deal he just made his debut last week um you know he could be kind of eventually kind of a chris bassett type guy um but it's going to take some time. Um, but a lot of the other guys that they got so far have not yet performed in a way that you would expect from what they gave up. So I think either way, there's no way Atlanta will ever regret those two deals, right? Like the, the, the A's could end up doing better in those deals than they look like they're doing now, but Atlanta will always be happy with the deals that they got. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, going on, on Ruiz here, I swear I don't like him on base because I'm convinced he's going to steal whatever the next base available to him at, at any time. And like, yeah, he's he's really good at it too. By the way, I mean, 64 yeah. steals. Like, he's I think the leader for the AL just passed Bobby Witt last night, and then there's only three behind Acuna for the MLB lead, which is crazy in its own right. But um, but yeah, Ruiz seems to be somebody I think that you know in today's baseball won't get a lot of attention because he doesn't hit the home runs, but he does a lot of other things really, really well. So um, he's a guy that is, yeah, I think you hit on the head. He could be a really good piece on contending teams for sure. Other prospects, uh, Melissa, that A's fans should be excited about that maybe they're not quite getting as much attention as some of the like top tier guys. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you see a few of them up there now. You know, Lawrence Butler's just getting his feet wet, but I think he's a guy that's going to be a big part of that offense and the defensive alignment in the outfield for quite some time. Um, I think Tyler Soderstrom, you know, is still a bat to believe in, even though the start has been really slow. Um, I think you can actually look to the way that Matt Olson debuted back in 2016 and early 2017 with the A's and kind of see what might be a similar progression for him offensively. Um, I think it, right below that, uh, Daryl Hornayas, the shortstop over um, in Las Vegas right now, but um, would you know probably be in contention, I would think, to be the sh everyday shortstop at the start of next season for the A's. Uh, 21 years old, they got him in, from Baltimore for Col Cole Irvin in the offseason. Might have been the best trade they made the whole offseason, actually. Um, hits for average, hits for power. He's got good speed. His defense has gotten better every year, can play multiple positions, but I think they could give him a shot at shortstop and see if he sticks there. Um, so, you know, I think I think there's as they've got Max Muncy's behind him, the other Max Muncy of <laughs> 2.0. Um, he was their, their, their first round pick in 2021 and, uh, you know, very quietly jumped up to double A. And, you know, I think his final OPS at that level was like 215 to, I mean, 820, 815, 820. And, you know, he's a really good defensive shortstop, uh, does a lot of things well, can hit for power, um, needs to control the strike zone better, but um, is a very good hitter. And then this year's number one pick, uh, Jacob Wilson, is, I think, a major league ready defensive shortstop now who makes, you know, a lot of contact. The quality of the contact, I think, is going to be the thing that, you know, determines where his ceiling is. If he can add some bulk and turn some of those line drives into home runs, you know, that'll make a big difference. But, um, you know, he's a guy that there's no question that he can play major league shortstop. So it's just a matter of, you know, where the offense goes. But, you know, he's, he, he hit 315 in the uh, high A Midwest League, which is not an easy league to hit in um, in his pro debut. So um, a guy to watch, I think, going into next year. Okay. All right. Well, we'll definitely keep our eyes on what the A's are doing, especially in their minor league system, because uh, they could have a very intriguing team that could sneak up on people that aren't quite following along or paying attention to them. Maybe not in the fashion like the Texas Rangers did this year, where they just bought every free agent that was available. Uh, that's not the easiest way. But you know, in terms of having the young young guys that you can build around, and you go make some key free agent veteran additions could you know take things to the next level. Um, it's been done before. We'll see what they do moving moving forward. But uh, Melissa, I know you kind of covered the Giants a little <laughs> bit, the San Francisco Giants. That is, um, do the Giants have any? Or have a star in their minor league system. I feel like they're they're a good team, like major league wise, but they just don't have anybody to get so excited like a Buster Posey type. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting. I mean, I think their farm system is significantly better than it was in 2018 when I started covering um, their farm system. But you're right; it's developed a lot of major league type players, but not necessarily stars yet. Um, I think there's some star potential there. I think Marco Luciano is a guy that the injuries didn't give him a chance to really uh, show what he could do this year. But, um, it, you know, I think he's averaging close to 100 miles per hour exit velocity in his limited major league time. Um, I'm not sure he's a shortstop, but I think offensive potential, regardless of where he plays, it's not going to matter um, that much. Uh, you know, I think this year's first round pick, Bryce Eldridge, you know, he had a big pro debut. He's a two-way player. They focused only on his hitting this year um, and he moved him out to right field. He'd been a first baseman in high school and uh, the hitting was really impressive and he hasn't even gotten on the mound yet. But, the, you know, you can see the like potential of what somebody like that could do. Um, so, you know, the, there's there's other guys. Reggie Crawford, their two way first round pick from the year before is, you know, throwing 98 from the left side and um, is now past his Tommy John rehab. And so I think next year you're going to hear a lot more from him. Carson Wisenhunt. They've got a lot of really good arms, uh, Mason Black, but the offensive side has been slower to develop that sort of star potential type player. So I think it, we'll have to kind of wait and see. But I would keep an eye on Bryce Eldridge. I think he's a guy that could jump into those top 100 lists next year. Okay. All right. And moving forward, similar question to what I asked with the A's. Do the Giants, is, or I should say, who's a prospect that Giants fans should be excited about that isn't getting uh, a lot of attention? Is it the aforementioned Eldridge, or is there somebody else? Yeah, I mean, I think I think he is. You know, I think um, Von Brown missed most of this year with injuries, but I think people were very, very excited about what he could potentially do last year, and he was already up to double A, so he's a guy that you could get really excited about again very quickly if he comes into spring healthy. Um, you know, there's, 
I mean, I, I think the guys that we talked about are probably their their main guys at this point. Um, the pitching is, I think, what's most impressive in the system right now. Mason Black's a guy. I'm surprised they didn't bring him up this year. He spent a lot of time in AAA. Um, but, you know, he's the potential to kind of move in and be that number two behind uh, Logan Webb and give them the, the inning, not just the, the quality of stuff, but the innings, I think, the consistent innings that they haven't seen from some of their other guys. Uh, Carson Wisenhand, as I said, I, you know, he moved up all the way to double A and I think would have jumped even further if a, an injury hadn't ended his season a month early. So um, probably on the pitching side at this point more than the position player side. Okay. Logan Webb certainly had himself a pretty good game last night going the yeah. complete game. Um, are the Giants, are they going to have a shot to maybe squeak into the playoffs here, or is it kind of, you know, we'll look for playoffs next season? Yeah, I mean, I think they would have to win out, and then like 18 different things would have to happen for them in order for So I, I think it's, you know, I, I haven't looked at their fan graphs playoff odds this morning, but I think it was down to like, you know, less than 1%. So um, probably not going to happen this year. Uh, that said, if it does happen at any point in the next couple of years, you know, best be sure that Logan Webb's going to be in the middle of it because that guy is like you know he's such a horse he's such a throwback to like what you expect major league aces to be um both demeanor wise and just you know his taking the ball every fifth day and going seven eight innings so a uh, really impressive guy and um someone you know people didn't talk about a ton coming up through the minor leagues and then he comes up there and does that so sometimes it's not the guys you talk about as much that that end up being you know the face of the franchise yeah, absolutely. And I feel like even from a national standpoint, he doesn't quite get the attention that someone like you just said, like should like he's, he's a very good pitcher, very durable pitcher. And we, we praise guys like Alcantara and Scherzer that can go nine innings kind of repeatedly. And Logan Webb does it, but he doesn't get the hype. So um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we see the Giants having some success next season and getting into the playoffs. They certainly have a very tough division with the Dodgers yeah. and Padres in there. But, um, Melissa, I'm going to turn now and let you have an opportunity to kind of brag about what you're working on next, brag about yourself and everything. So let some of the fans know what, what we can expect from you moving forward. Yeah, so it's uh, moving into maybe my favorite time of the year, which is the off season. Um, but not just because the, the regular season isn't going, but so much happens in the off season. You know, uh, we'll have lots of stuff on you know, Rule Five previews: who's going to be protected on forty-man rosters and who isn't. Uh, top prospect lists, um, a lot of Arizona Fall League coverage, um, speculation about trades, and all that sort of stuff. So um, obviously the postseason too. But I mean, I think uh, a lot of what fans really love is sort of that off season kind of hot stove stuff that comes around so um we're going to get to see a lot of that on the athletic um so we invite everybody to come over and join us okay awesome well everybody again this has been melissa lockhart joining us she's the senior editor and staff writer for the athletic she is the founder of the oakland clubhouse and a member of the bay area chapter of the baseball writers association you can find her on x at melissa lockhart um, do you have any other social media platforms? That I'm, on I, I'm on all those other ones. I haven't figured out yet which one's the one that's going to be the main one if, if uh, X doesn't make it. So um, for now, I'll, I'll let everybody know on there. <laughs> okay. Out. Awesome. Awesome. And again, for everybody following along with the show, you can find us on X at Replacement Level 1. You can find myself on there at C underscore Phillips underscore 13. Our other co-host, Rafal, who is, again, still over in Israel enjoying his gap year. You can find him at Rafal N613. We are on Spotify. We're on YouTube. We're on Apple Podcasts. Follow us there. Share with us. Like, interact with us on there. Like I tell you guys all the time, like, we love to chat baseball with you. Give us your thoughts. Give us your inputs. Tell us where we're right. Tell us where we're wrong. Obviously, me personally, I like to hear more times when I'm right because uh, I kind of like me some me. But, you know, also, I like some discussion about baseball. It, the season is coming to a close here soon, which means we're getting into postseason and off season. So, Melissa, again, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. We definitely look forward to having you on again in the future, talking about the A's and the Giants as well. And for everybody else that's following along, thank you guys for tuning in. And until next time, see ya. Thanks.